This presentation is about the roots of meaning, or what I mean by the meaning of life, the quest for meaning, and the crisis of meaning in modern times. This is really the root of the work that I do, whether it's about conservatism, relationships, you know, all of my thought and video really begins with an analysis of meaning and meaning in human life. So this really is the, the foundation of what I do. Now, meaning begins with kind of the human condition, which is, the fancy word for that is finitude, coming from f the French fin, which means the end. But um, the, the limit, another way of putting it, the human condition is both limited and unlimited. And that's, that's really the root of the problem that meaning tries to solve. By infinite and finite, I mean we know that humans will someday die. Um, and so we're limited in terms of time. There's an end to our time in this universe. At the same time, um, we can imagine endless time, infinite time, and something beyond time. And so humans have this funny relationship in being finite and imagining the infinite. And not just imagining the infinite, but a sense of belonging to the infinite. And I'll say a little bit more about that, but it's, it's more of an intuition than really anything too rational. But if we think about all the categories of existence, not just time, but space, humans are limited both in terms of the space that we will be able to traverse over the course of our life and also just this limited space that we occupy and yet we can imagine space beyond space. Um, limited in our knowledge, um, so there's limited things that we can know or be certain of and, and yet we can imagine having infinite knowledge or a perfect knowledge of various subjects. We're limited in terms of our morals, in terms of how much consideration we give to others, how much courage we have, how much we live up to our promises, how much we live up to what we know is good. Um, and yet we can imagine ourselves and have a sense of ourselves as deserving infinite courage and we can demand of ourselves infinite morals. Um, beauty, we're limited in the beauty just like everything else in the universe. Um, we have limits to the beauty that we express and access. Um, and yet we can imagine a perfect beauty for ourselves and the universe around us, the society around us, the people around us, the nature around us. The same with truth. Um, that we can speak a perfect truth and yet um, we can fall short and be limited. We're all limited in the truth that we speak, consideration, and so on and so forth. And the ultimate limit really is death. Um, we don't know when or how. We don't know our destiny really on this earth. And yet we know that we will die. And so we spend our whole lives being able to anticipate it. Um, and then, like I said, the thing, one thing that I really want to bring out is this, this intuition that we belong in the infinite on some level. And so the search for meaning really begins as an attempt to bridge this gap between finite and infinite, despite all of these limits. Um, a kind of life beyond death, or a contribution, something we do that survives our own life. So meaning is a solution to this situation of the gap between infinite and finite that exists within every human. It, it's a metaphor, and so um, like any metaphor, we can start with its root meaning, <laughs> so to speak, uh, forgive the pun, um, so if we think about the word tree, the word tree is meaningful or has meaning because it points to something. It refers to something. It refers to a plant, a tree, um, a thing out there in the world, in forests. And so that's what makes the word tree meaningful. Now I can make up a word like googly goop. And let's just say I tell you that googly goop means tree. Well, googly goop might be kind of a funny word that I just invented. And you might be like, why are you making up a word for when we already have the word tree and the word tree is good enough? But nonetheless, if I tell you that googly goop means tree, 
And then later on, I'm talking about the googly goop over there. You'll probably look over at the tree and still think I'm weird, but you'll, the word will still be meaningful. Now, when the invented word ceases to be meaningful is when googly goop, when I tell you that googly goop actually just means googly goop or some other made up word like goggly gog. Um, at some point, if googly goop just means this made up word googly goop, it is essentially a meaningless word. Okay. Um, it's meaningful if it means tree, but it's meaningless if it it's, means itself. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to articulate a kind of a very, very crude principle that comes out of this. And many, some people, I'm a little bit afraid some people are going to run away unless I warn you that I'm going to make this more um, inclusive and more subtle than, than what I'm saying right now. But the very crude principle is that a human life has meaning if it points beyond itself, kind of like a word, if it points to something, if it contributes to something uh, beyond itself. Okay? Um, and the closer to infinity that thing is, uh, the more meaningful it is. So the more sort of invincible it is to all the forces of finitude, of death, of limit, um, the more meaningful it is. And that um, again, that closer to infinity bait, you're going to think, <laughs> bear with me, because I know some people are going to run and tell you I'm asking you to believe in God, which I'm really not. <laughs> um, uh, but living for oneself, um, again, crude principle that we're going to make much more interesting in just a moment. But the idea is that living for oneself is relatively meaningless. Just like a word that refers to itself, well, uh, living for oneself uh, is relatively meaningless. So before I get to the complications, let me just tell you what meaning does. So let's say you found the meaning of your life. What does that do? Well, the first thing to say is that meaning is a bit on a spectrum. So if we define it, it's not a black and white thing. It's not that a life is meaningful or meaningless, um, unlike, let's say, a word. Um, it's a spectrum. So a life can be more or less meaningful, it's not black and white. Um, but we could define it as concrete actions, so actions that take place in time and space that feel somehow infinitely important. That's what meaning is. Um, and so the, it has a psychological effect. That's the important thing to retain about meaning, is that what we're looking for is a kind of peace with the limits that we have in our life. So we're looking to do things in our life, to do something, contribute something um, with our life, um, and yet have a feeling that it was, you know, restful yet purposeful, not exhausting, um, and yet we're at peace with the limits that we have. It seems that humans are easily discouraged. And so this quest for meaning really is a kind of quest for a psychological peace, uh, a sense of satisfaction, and not just like a passive peace, like uh, I'm just going to sit in this pool and just look at the forest, um, but like an active kind of peaceful purposefulness. Um, and when that meaning is destroyed, and I'll get to some examples of this in a moment, uh, and you'll kind of see what I mean, um, it's like living on death row. It's like we're alive, and yet we're sentenced to death, and we're in a prison where the things that we do don't really have meaning because it's an institution. So that's just like a metaphor for thinking about what happens when the the meaning that people have constructed with their lives is destroyed. Um, whether it be through the thing that they've dedicated their life to being destroyed or just realizing, oh, this is the fear that this is empty of meaning and really I've been, I don't know, wasting my time. Um, Paul Tillich calls, you know, a meaningful life having an ultimate concern, Paul Tillich being a theologian. Um, but just to say that there's an element of choice. We kind of, on some level, to some degree, we choose what the meaning of our life is, our ultimate concern, the thing that concerns us ultimately. Um, and the thing, and this is getting into the examples uh, right here, the thing to keep in mind about meaning is that it's as fragile as the thing that it refers to. All right, so let me get into some examples that make this, uh, that really flesh this out. So first, like I said, self-interest, maximizing profit, you know, dedicating one's life to 
too much of that, and I know this is kind of a um, simplified and maybe even polemical example, but the point isn't to judge anybody. The point is just to uh, give a very simple example that illustrates what I'm talking about. Okay, we've kind of covered this already. Another is we could think about hedonism. So trying to find uh, the meaning of life by maximizing pleasure in the things that one does. And again, this is maybe a simplistic example. It's maybe almost more um, polemical than it is really analytical. But again, it just illustrates what I'm talking about. But we're going to come back to hedonism as a more complex example in just a moment. Um, but my point is, think about the fragility that I've been talking about. For instance, you talk about maximizing profit. Let's say one has dedicated their life to their business, and then through bad luck or a downturn in the economy or who knows what, uh, the business is completely you know, upturned and the person is penniless. Um, so would you say that their life has been meaningless? Well, I don't, I wouldn't, but in that moment, they might, there's a shock that comes and then there's this sense of, well, what have I just done? Like, why have I done that? And really, if they've um, dedicated so much time to self-interest and their self-interest don't work out through destiny and fate beyond their control or even within their own control, uh, they make mistakes. Um, you know, that's just an example of the fragility of these first examples. Uh, which are the simplest ones. The second is hedonism, you know, seeking pleasure. Well, what happens when life isn't so pleasurable? What if one gets an illness um, or is in, you know, chronic pain? Um, what is, if one has based one's life on hedonism and one is in constant pain, um, that's an example of fragile meaning because not only is that person in physical pain, but they're also in a kind of psychological pain of feeling like their life has no meaning. Um, now, one that's very common is the next generation, whether that's one's own children or, you know, making things better for the next generation, a general sense of progress. And again, this is really noble, and I'm not saying there's anything wrong with this. I'm just pointing out um, when this is fragile, and I hope this isn't depressing anybody because it's really not my point. Um, really, my point is to kind of say, uh, you know, this is why we have a crisis of meaning in modern times. But anyway, that's another subject, and it's to help gain more compassion, not only for conservatism, but also to think about marriage in a different way. So that's really the goal of this, is not to uh, depress anybody. This is to build solutions that are more stable. But anyway, so if we think about the next generation, you know, think about a parent that spends a bunch of time raising a child, and then that child you know, is, I don't know, Hitler or something awful, where you're just like, man, I tried to raise this child and they just turned out terrible. Um, and you just like, that's just an example of how that sense of meaning can be upended. Or the next generation, you know, you don't feel like they've made progress. And although I believe in technological progress, moral progress is uh, a much more iffy and suspicious uh kind of progress than technical progress, which is absolutely undeniable. All right, so I'm just giving examples of how this is fragile. But the advantage with the next generation is that instead of centering our meaning on oneself, at least it's transferred outward, outwards. And so one can focus on a kind of benevolence and well, well-being, you know, benevolence and doing well for others. Um, but it's fragile if, you know, that next generation, let's say cuts your pension or something like that. Uh, that's, that's, that can lead to a crisis of meaning, a personal crisis of meaning. So as you can see, these are getting a little bit more convincing and a little bit more complex with time. You know, what about doing good to others? I think that's actually not far from a very solid source of meaning. Uh, but it does come with its own risks. And like I said, all of it's always a risk. That's what uh, Paul Tillich says when he thinks about ultimate concern. There really isn't a safe choice. Like anything you choose is a risk. And it's worth risking something to have a meaningful life. So, but anyway, doing good to others. Um, so again, again, instead of focusing on oneself, one can focus outwards. Um, and, but like what if uh, you get robbed? You know, you come home and your house has been burglarized. And it's not just somebody that, you know, they were impulsive or needed a few bucks. Like, they've clearly been spying on you, like, casing your house. 
you leave and they go like right to your valuables or like break things and you're just like, wow, I spent all this time doing good to others and it's like a slap in the face to live. And that's just like a very, that's a very minor example. I could give much more extreme ones of living in, you know, extremely selfish societies in crisis of, you know, war torn societies where there's a lot of selfishness and horrificness going on. Um, like this isn't, this isn't as easy or as rosy as it sounds because there are times when good, doing good to others, well, we need to do good to ourselves. And anyway, it gets complicated very fast doing good to others. Um, but my point is like in that moment when people aren't doing good to us too, um, there is, there's a shock that comes in and th this is more fragile than it seems. Um, but let me give you another example that I think, again, these are getting closer and closer to, to what I think are like safer grounds of finding meaning. Um, let's return to hedonism, which sounded like, like an easy one to dismiss, but now we're going to finally make things more complicated and <laughs> make me sound less judgmental and less moralizing. So, uh, so consider somebody that says, um, I'm going to focus on my own pleasure and living a life where I maximize my own pleasure because as a woman, let's say, you know, when it's a wo I'm a woman, um, as a woman, I, you know, women have been oppressed for thousands of years and women have been taught to take care of their husbands, take care of their children, you know, and that women just do what they're told and they keep quiet. Well, that has made women not in touch with themselves. And I, as a modern woman, I want to be in touch with my pleasure. So you see what happened there? It's pleasure is still the root of it. And yet there's an overall narrative of justice, of redemption, of, you know, writing a historical wrong through hedonism through focusing on pleasure and getting to know one's own self of uh, a sense of pleasure as an act of resistance. Um, and so you see how complicated this makes this. It's not that simple. Um, and you see, even a woman that's in pain would say, okay, I'm in pain now, but I can still get to know my pleasure within this pain, or I can still express myself and have needs you know, and not serve others when I need to take care of myself, for instance. And so this is a stronger kind of meaning because it's a little bit, you know, it's pointing at something larger and more encompassing and more uh, accessible. Um, just as a suggestion, uh, again, I'm not pushing this God thing on anybody, but I do want to point out that God traditionally has four names that I want to name for you um, because I think some people might find it interesting to consider these four names of God as, you know, solid, solid places to put place meaning, or at least I consider perhaps less risky. And they are love, truth, beauty, and justice. So in the example above, um, although it sounds like hedonism and it looks like hedonism, um, it actually is oriented around not only justice for women, but love for women, love for oneself, uh, truth, and a just truth, not just like a hurtful truth for no reason, but a truth that is filled with justice and therefore is true, and the beauty of, you know, life that's possible that when we live in love and truth and justice, um, life is beautiful, and we have access to the fullness of life at that moment. Um but you see how this makes the things that I said before that I said were going to sound kind of judgy, um, it makes it sound better. So, for instance, um, self-interest. In the case of, I don't know, financial self-interest, in the case of a person who was historically poor or had never been comfortable in their lives, um, and then they're able to take more of a working, I don't know, middle-class white-collar job and make, you know, money to make their parents comfortable, themselves comfortable, their children comfortable, so that they don't have to live through that anymore. Just just, a, just an example. Um, 
And I'm not saying that's unproblematic by any means. All I'm pointing out is that we can complicate these narratives. And the more they're close to this notion of justice and redemption and um, the next generation and things like that, uh, the more complex they are and the less fragile they are as well. Uh, the same with authentic expression. Um, you know, we could say that, I don't know, years of oppression caused people to not be in touch with their authentic truth feelings, you know, and not just women, but all kinds of people. Um, or that, you know, the church having oversized and abusive authority over people um, got in the way of people's autonomy, which, by the way, is true. So um, it really depends what you know, what narrative we're putting around these things and where they fit in and what they mean. But this, I hope this all makes this notion of meaning clearer. And what I want to emphasize is that there really is no safe place. I'm giving orientations that make things, you know, a little bit safer and a little bit like if I were to, if someone asked me, you know, where should I place... <laughs> my ultimate concern, where should I place my faith, my, where should I find meaning in my life, whew, you know, I would say there's no safe place to do it, you got, we've got to all take a risk, and, um, and we got to do our best, and anything we choose, you know, be as ambitious and as generous as possible to oneself and to others, and we won't ever regret it, which is the good news, um, but there might be times when we realize, ooh, you know, I came to this with the wrong intention, and we live that moment, it's kind of depressing, really, where meaning runs out and we feel like we're on death row. Um, there's no escaping that risk, but uh, I would encourage people to live boldly, live love and truth, uh, and try to maximize the beauty around them, and always live for justice. And I think that the rest uh, takes care of itself.